Well, hi guys. Well, welcome back to the channel. Well, today's video is all about selling up to live in a camper van, a motorhome, or indeed an overland truck. It doesn't really matter what you're in. It's that tiny home on wheels. And a big shout out to We Have Any Campers because we're actually sat in one of their gorgeous little lands here, camper vans right now. And well, I'm going to hand over to Izzy actually because we've been contacted by lots and lots of people over the years who well, Izzy, do you want to pick it up? I do. Hand over. Come on. Um, so one of the reasons we wanted to make this video was, was A, we, we thought there are probably quite a lot of people out there watching us who don't really know our background. And B, we get so many people contacting us on a really regular basis saying, am I crazy? Is this is this the maddest thing I've ever done? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I want to live up and, and uh, sell up and live in a motorhome, um, but I, I, I'm terrified. I'm really nervous. So we try and talk to people uh, about the things that happened to us when we made that decision in the hopes that it might help and we, look we don't know everything but we can certainly share our experience and hope that that might give you some pointers about things to think about practical things to do in the process and what it actually feels like when you when you're going through it so mm. we put together a set of questions that we think everybody that's planning on doing this should be asking um, and really the first one is what's your goal and I I say that from a very heartfelt position really because I I always thought that my goal was to go off and see the world and open my eyes to new cultures and new people and new experiences. The reality is when I look back, I think actually I was just running away. Um, I think Phil's goal was slightly different, but for me, I was in a, well, if we go back a step, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll keep it short and sweet, we, we were, you know, we had good jobs, we had a house which we had spent six years renovating, it was gonna be our forever home. We were able to take a nice holiday every year. Financially, we were okay. Um, but we felt like there was just something a bit missing. I, Phil had spent 25 years in the army and, and retrained as a plumber and then a building inspector. He had some really great skills. I had never really known what I wanted to do and I'd ended up falling into an industry that I didn't enjoy working in. I'd lost my passion for it and I really didn't like the job I was doing. I didn't like the people I was working for. Um, and I found it very stressful uh, and so we we had an epiphany one night we were chatting and we said what about you know what about if we sold up and went to live in a motorhome for a couple of years and it was going to be a couple of years it was two mm. years we would bank the money from the house we would come back and buy something else and start again obviously that didn't happen but that's a story for another another day um, but we got to this point where we felt we wanted to change our lives and just live differently Phil, do you want to talk a little bit about your motivation and how you felt? So after 25 years in the army, I retrained, actually retrained as a plumber whilst I was in the army. I worked on the tools for a bit and uh, eventually I retrained again to be a building inspector. We had always done property as a sideline, so we developed property and sort of built property. And, it was, and I loved it. You know, I loved my job. I worked in the New Forest. It was a beautiful environment. Uh, I worked with a great team of people and I thoroughly enjoyed getting up and going to work every day. Um, Izzy was, was, you know, the opposite of becoming maybe a little bit more disgruntled, but we had this underlying passion for travel. Mm -hmm. And so we would go off on our travels, usually on motorbikes and we go further afield, but we, st we always loved that sort of road trip. And, and it was always there. And it was, it was always, you know, where's the next trip? Where's the next adventure? And so we, we decided one night that actually, why wouldn't we? change our lives why wouldn't we take some time out of life and go and do something a bit more exciting mm. and that's what we did I, I don't think we quite realized and this sort of leads on to the next question about the compromises that we would have to make to achieve that dream um, we sold our house and we'll talk a little bit more about selling versus renting in a moment but we sold our house that was our dream house uh, it was our forever home. We'd put a lot of work into renovating it and making it gorgeous, but we sold it because we needed the money to facilitate the dream. Um, you have to compromise in terms of what you can take with you, and I found that very difficult to start off with. I can look back with hindsight now and say that I was probably quite materialistic. I had a lovely handbag collection. Um, you know, I like shoes. Um, now I own about three pairs of shoes, and they're all trainers. Um, so there, there, there will always be compromises about what you can take with you, mm. what you leave behind, um, and there might have to be compromises in your relationship too. I think we're both quite fiery, uh, and we, it's really tested us. Um, so if you're thinking about 
selling up to live in a motorhome because you've got problems in your relationship, it's probably not going to help, I would say. But just stick with the whole compromise thing. This lifestyle is a compromise, but you know, even, you know, this video really is about, you know, do a sell up and, and go full time. I, and so that whole sort of process leading up to that is about compromise, it's about what you're going to travel in, what size is it going to be, yeah. how much is it going to cost, yeah. how, you know, do you have to compromise on your spending, probably. Um, you, you're going to have to compromise on sort of what you take with you because of weight restrictions, Yeah. You, how many campsites you might sort of stay in. So if you've got a van already and you've got going off for so you're two weeks and three weeks and think, oh, this is amazing, I love this lifestyle, it's a very different experience when you're full time. Yes. Because chances are that you can stay on a campsite every night. You probably don't want to. We certainly don't want to. That's not our first choice. And therefore, you know, but, but there, there are compromises. There are compromises how much water you can use. There's compromises with... There's a lot of compromises, Everything. I think. What, you get the idea. Yeah, is what feels yeah. fun. And when you're when you're deep in the moment of trying to dis of, of the excitement of making that decision, you don't always think about those things. Yeah. Um, I suppose the biggest question for a lot of people, and lots of people contact us and say, "How do you afford it? What's your budget? How do you earn money on the road? Why did you sell your house? Why didn't you rent it?" And all of those questions are are really key because if you can't afford it, then clearly you you can't do it. So for us. With hindsight, I wish we'd have been able to find a way to keep our house and to rent it. Or I wish that we'd have taken the money that we made from it and rented or bought something smaller somewhere else in the UK that we could have rented mm. out. But we chose for various reasons not to do those things. Um, we had, we were very lucky because Phil had a military pension and it was just about enough to manage on day to day. Just. Probably not now, maybe because of inflation and the pension doesn't increase with inflation. Um, but every time we wanted to do something like book a flight home to see family, um, replace the tyres on the motorhome, pay for the annual insurance, get a ferry, we had to dip into our savings. So that really wasn't ideal. Um, and we started off with a sort of a, a pot that we that was meant to last for two years and it, it lasted for about a year. And I think we realised quite quickly that mm. actually the lifestyle wasn't going to be sustainable on the amount of income that we had coming in um, and that that wasn't actually why I started the, the Gap Decaders um, but it certainly has helped uh, so th there's that I think what happens though as well is you, you go off and and we set off in June and you have this we well we had this sort of honeymoon period you know mm. we, we went straight into France the weather was incredible we you know we stayed in a lot of sites because we had air conditioning in the van but we needed to plug in and so we stayed in a lot of gorgeous sites we did lots of activities and it all cost money and so the but, first uh, year we did actually spend a huge amount yeah. of money that we ordinarily wouldn't we treated it like we were on holiday though oh, yeah. really didn't we and i'd say that but that's perhaps a pitfall when you're starting out if you are on a strict budget it isn't a holiday but it felt like a holiday for us and i think we maybe we got a little bit carried away um so i i would say if you can find a way of keeping hold of a property then you should try and do that if that if that obviously if that works for you yeah um we'll talk about working on the road in a little bit but i just wanted to go on to the next sort of question that maybe you you could ask um who are you traveling with and that's really key you've got to like the person that you're going to be spending all that time in a little box it's with. obviously common sense isn't it but it, it's true and there's no question that this lifestyle will We'll test you, you know, because it doesn't matter how big your van is or your truck is, you're still within those those four walls. And you you do spend, you know, one minute you're sort of you're doing your nine to five, you come home, is it was it was away a lot of the week, so the weekends it was a little bit of sort of We weren't uh, used to being together all day, we every day. And then suddenly, although it was a honeymoon period, after about six weeks, mm. you start grating on each other. Yeah. And that's the truth of it. We we had a couple of really big rows quite early on and then I think we we set off in um july and we june. got june sorry and we got into portugal um just as the clocks were changing and suddenly it was getting dark at four o'clock we couldn't cook outside we didn't want to sit outside because it was actually starting to get quite cold um and i can remember having <laughs> weeks of thinking what have we done this is such a mistake i can't you know and phil and i were were in a place where we weren't very probably very nice to each other and we weren't really good friends and that's not like us at all uh, but we came out the other side of it but it was quite difficult uh, and I think if if we hadn't had a solid relationship we might not have survived we might have said okay this isn't for us let's go home
I, I was still loving it, and this is the problem then. So, so Izzy, <laughs> yeah. was, Izzy was getting grumpy and, oh, we've made a mistake. And I was like, no, we haven't. This is this is amazing. So straight away, we're in opposing sides. We're, I, I, we're seeing it differently. Yeah. I was also menopausal through the yeah. first couple of years of our travel, which probably didn't help very much either. So maybe timing is a key thing too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so who are you traveling with? The other big thing is, what about family? You know, are you leaving behind elderly parents? Have you got kids or having kids of their own? Do you want to be away um, f for, for, you know, that sort of time? Um, I mean, we're assuming that you're going to go away and travel. So do you want to be away from your family? And some people decide that they don't, that they don't want that. They're too close or um, yeah. there's too many important things going on. I just want to say, You've sort of skipped on a little bit there because you know in terms of who you travel with. Now we've seen we've seen lots and lots of people. We've met lots of lovely families on the road. We have with kids, yeah. you know, with with kids, and dogs, dogs, and, and yeah. God, everything, Babies. cats, and all sorts. And it is very very doable. Obviously, things tend to slow down a bit if you've got kids, and so you know, lots of people have these aspirations. Oh, we're going to go and see all this stuff, but again in a small space particularly if you've got prams and dogs and you know it dogs have to be walked children have to be looked after and it, it it's a slightly different way of traveling so but if you have kids you know, and a van already you'll and know homeschooling that. is entirely possible we've yeah. met lots of people oh, yeah. who do that yeah um so so those are the sorts of things really to think about that you know and i suppose just in a nutshell to summarize that you know take the rose-coloured spectacles off and try and see the reality of it. It's not always an easy lifestyle to choose. I, I always say to people, look, you know, we're doing video calls and so on, be honest with each other. More importantly, be honest with yourself. Yeah. You know, really write down those pros and cons. Really, honestly and truly, we did it. We, we you know, it's all, because it's all swirling about in your head at this early stage and it's, it's all over the place. So try and sort of crystallise that, write it down, I know it sounds a bit crazy, but sometimes when you're actually looking at it, going and you and then and then you can analyze mm. each one of them, mm. and 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 try and be sort of rational about it, and, and say, well, actually, yeah, I don't, that's not a problem for me, or that could be a problem for me, and almost anticipate sort of that journey, if you yes. like. Yes. Yeah, which actually sort of leads on to the the other thing we wanted to talk about, which was what are the practical things you can do when you're sort of trying to make this decision because you you might make a snap decision and I think we probably made a very quick decision but for a lot of people it takes quite a long time to to process the idea of selling up and moving into a motorhome yeah. so practical tasks Phil's just talked about one making a list of pros and cons and we did that endlessly um, until we were until we were really sure about the the path that we yeah were going I mean to go we, we had two weeks honestly of sleepless nights yeah and it, it was a it was a process I think that we have to go through it's a process that everyone has to go through to to really because you you, you sort of know in your head right this is what I want to do but it it isn't always the right decision and we know people that have actually gone off for six months with the intention of going for much longer yeah. and said no not for us this isn't for us and so you know they lost a lot of money in a van there's going back all the upset with the whole house thing and and it just becomes complicated yeah. and and so it really isn't for everyone no and actually if you are not a motorhome owner and you've never motorhomed or spent time in a camper van or, or wherever yeah. hire one for two weeks go around holiday see how yeah. you feel about it because you'll very quickly get an idea of whether you whether you, it's for you or not yeah um, assessing your finances is really key. We saw a financial advisor, we got the house valued, we understood how much equity we had, what we would need to to buy a motorhome, um, yeah. you know, what we thought we could earn from that equity if we invested it in the right way. So there were all of those sorts of things um, that we needed to do. And actually for us, we we had sunk all of our savings into the property so we didn't have enough money to buy a motorhome part of the reason why we needed to sell the house we actually bought our first motorhome on higher purchase and when we were getting to the point of um, coming to the sale uh, we were paying a mortgage and we were paying 
um, higher purchase on this very expensive motorhome and our house sale we thought was going to fall through and right at the last minute it didn't and it was a very what I would call a squeaky bum moment I think where we you know where we had a lot invested and actually we weren't get, getting to the outcome that we wanted. It, uh, it was the absolute wrong way to go about this totally, whole thing. Yes. We literally handed our notice in, we, we hadn't exchanged, never mind completed. Yeah. We, we, it was, we all aiming towards this date that we had sort of put in the diary, mm. it's going to happen. Yeah. And it was honestly, we had the house, the house was sold, we sold yeah. the contents of the house, the house was empty, we were in the van and we had an exchange. And honestly, I can't, I would never yeah. do it again. No. It was, it was so too stressful. stressful. I'm not a stressy, stressy and person. And actually what ended oof. up happening was the, the day that both, uh, both of our notice periods came to an end was the day that we exchanged and it was also the day that we left to start our new life in a motorhome and that's three huge <laughs> things happening at the same time <laughs> yeah I look back now and I think what on earth were we thinking and we met some people recently who were so had it so mapped out clear time frames time to process time to do it in the right order and I just thought yeah I wish we'd have done that but we didn't and we're here to tell you not to do it either it's because Izzy's so impatient that's why that's probably got something to do with it yeah um so once you've done all of that, talk to your family, talk to your friends, get a view, prepare yourself for the fact they might not all be delighted for you. Um, some some people can't contextualise it, they, they don't understand it. I mean, I, I think, you know, there are, there are a generation of people whose aim in life was to own a property and have a job, um, you know, and marry the right person and have kids and do all those sort of expected things. And I think if you turn that on its head, that's quite a shock for them. Um, mm -hmm. Our kids thought we were really cool, uh, but but there are there were other people in our family who were a bit jealous. They didn't really understand uh, what we were trying to do, or wish they could do it themselves. Um, so that was uh, that was a surprise that we weren't expecting. Um, so you need to talk to those guys and make sure you've got some support from some place in your family at least. Yeah. Um, do your research. Uh, we didn't do it anywhere near enough of it. Um, and I think if we had it done, we might have made some different choices about the motorhome that we bought and how much money we spent on that, that we then later unbought or sold to buy something else. Um, so there's a lot of research to be done. We have actually written a book that's a sort of a companion to this video, Selling Up to Live in a Motorhome, which you can buy on the website. Uh, we'll put a link below. And we, we talk about all of that in a bit more detail, really. Mm. There's, a, there's a little saying in the army, research, research, research. And... I didn't even sort of heed our own device. I thought maybe a little bit of arrogance. Actually, I thought oh, we we know better. We're you know we yeah. we know what we're doing. You can't you can never research no. enough. I mean, even sort of five and a half years in, we're still learning. Yeah, we so. we were very much in a place of um, we wanted nice shiny things. We were still yeah. in that sort of we go to work and earn decent money mode. So we bought. Uh, uh, almost new Catargo, which was gorgeous. It was cost nearly a hundred thousand pounds, which is ridiculous for yeah. what we wanted it for. Because we wanted to go exploring, we wanted to go off road a little bit, and we found ourselves eight months later in Tarifa, wanting to go to Morocco, but not wanting to risk taking the Catargo. So we ended up selling it and buying a another big A-class motorhome, but it was a lot older and it had a few more miles on the clock. Fabulous. It still did everything we needed, yeah. but it cost a third less. And actually, I look back on that decision now and think, if we had have bought that first time round, we might not have had to sell our house, or we'd have had a bit more money to invest to get more money back in terms of interest and yeah. so on. Yeah. So the research is really, really key. And we've met a few other people with, with gorgeous big vans and you know they're all shiny and lovely and, and but they're really precious about the mm. van and I was and what you sort of find is when you have a sort of an older van it's got a few marks and scuffs on it you're like well it's okay it's it's it's, it's fine yeah. and and if you go in further afield have a think about you know if if something sort of happened whether it's a breakdown or a, an, an incident of some sort if you were to walk away from it would it be yeah. The end of the world. Yeah. So walking away from a hundred k or a hundred and fifty k van, that's an issue. Truck, whatever it is. Yeah. But and you know, we, I, we knew there were lots of places we wanted to go where we'd have to buy third-party insurance at the border, and we really weren't happy taking yeah. that sort of risk. 
Um, I mean, look, if you're absolutely loaded and that's what you want to do, fine. But for us, and I would say for most people that contact us, yeah. um, these are the sorts of questions people ask. They want to get it right first time around. We have a book about that as well, by the way, but I'm not going to do any well, more Are you going to stop the plug <laughs> Bloody hell. Um, I think th th there are some other practical things that you might want to sort of think about as well, like addresses. How are you going to manage? You, you need an address somewhere in the UK to register your vehicle and for your driving license. The DVLA. Um, won't allow you to register at a non-residential address. You, you might want to think about, you know, talking to your GP, particularly if you need medication yeah. or you've got long-term condition. Um, so there are those sorts of things. Storage, where are you going to put your stuff? You, you, we ended up with sort of four piles of things, things to throw, things to eBay, things that we were going to take with us in the van and things that went into storage. And believe me, it is a lot more complicated moving from a house into a van than it is moving from house to house because you've got to work mm. out where all this stuff goes um, yeah. and storage is quite expensive so it's, it's worth taking some time to yeah don't underestimate the the um, the, the not the theory the uh, administration oh god yeah that's absolutely. what I'm looking for the administration and who's going to sort of uh, look after that in your behalf we just like come on it's a digital age okay it was early 2018 and we thought, yeah, but everything's online these days, but you still get mailed, mm. you still, you know, it's it's still a sort of an issue. So to have someone there to yeah. administer on your behalf Big shout out to helpful. my mum who does all that for me. She opens everything and photographs it and sends it on to me so that if we need to do anything, um, we can do that. Chief administrator. <laughs> yeah, thanks mum. Um, so, so those are some sort of practical things you can do. We have notes. We do have notes. Yeah. Um, in terms of... What can go wrong? Well, time frames we've already sort of talked about for us in terms of selling a house is never a straightforward process. Um, getting divorced, that could go wrong. Yeah. Um, we've managed to avoid that, but... Yeah, just. Yeah. Just. Yeah. Um, one of the things I would say as well is throughout this whole sort of process leading up are we making the right decision have we you know have we, are we going to make this monumental um mistake you will get cold feet yes you you will. you will go through your process of being very excited but then equally saying no i i think we're you know maybe one of you saying i think we're making a mistake and then the other one's going really I, no I, I don't think so and then two weeks or a week down the line it you know the things could change and there's mm. a complete role reversal and you go maybe we are making a, a, a mistake so you will go through that process without question but it's important that you do all of that because yeah. you'll come out at the end of it knowing you've made the right decision yeah and, but i think that's where it comes in you know sitting down and writing down the pros and cons and yes, working through that absolutely. And, then, and maybe revisiting that yeah. that's really really helpful yeah. so just moving on to the probably the second most asked question about is about after whether you rent or sell is about working on the road. A lot of people contact us and say, what can we do on the road? What options are there? Um, and it's very difficult to answer that until you know the person's skill set or you know what, what, what they're good at, what they think they might want to do. But we are in the digital nomad age. There are you know so many courses out there online where you can teach yourself how to do a job that you could do from a laptop um, in a van somewhere. Um, and we meet lots of people doing that. Some of them work for themselves, some of them work for other people. Um, and it's quite interesting to see that, that variety that's out there. It, for us, um, we make our money from the gap decaders. Um, and that didn't start as a money-making exercise. It started because I was a little bit bored. I just needed something to occupy myself. And it was the winter, so we were spending a lot of time inside. Uh, and I thought it'd be nice to let people know, friends and family, where we were, what we were up to. And then I realized that maybe I could make some money doing it. So I completely self-taught myself um, how to build a website. It's not actually that difficult. Uh, and There's so much information on the web as well in terms of, yeah. I mean, YouTube's brilliant tutorials on youtube yeah you can learn pretty much anything on there yeah. so uh yeah hats off because it, it isn't something that i would have embarked upon and i think it, it was quite an organic journey for izzy it was yes i think if, if we'd have said we're selling up to start a, a blog mm. um that's going to make money to sustain a lifestyle we never would have done it because we'd have been yeah. terrified and thought yeah. well, that's just not possible yeah. because we didn't we weren't really that big on sort of social media or the, or the web. We, Zero. Yeah. So we had to learn all that too. Phil had to learn how to YouTube. Um, and <laughs> it took two years before we made any money at all. And I'm talking two years of 
60 hour weeks some weeks sometimes longer so it didn't always feel like we were living the dream did it mm. it felt like we had swapped one form of working for another really but we were working for ourselves and we were doing it in some lovely places and so that was the I suppose that was the payoff yeah and now it's become a little bit more self-sustaining a little bit more passive um, and so it, for us it's worked out it is definitely something to explore and if you know if you want to have a chat through whether it's something you might want to do I can I'd be happy to spend time talking about it in more detail as you can tell I'm quite passionate about but, it but I think you know this is where the property thing comes into its yes. own you know if you do if you can downsize if you can hold on to your property and, and have that as your as your income and lots of people Absolutely. do it for that yeah. reason so they they know what the budget is yeah. every month we also know people that do lots of um, house sitting um, and so that saves them fees on things like campsites and water and um, so on and gives them a bit of respite as a yeah. full timer it's, it's quite hard work and yeah. so taking some time out and come back into a property and, and you know dog sitting or whatever it is yeah. for, for two weeks or a month whatever in a nice location yeah. is, uh, is a nice thing to do for a lot of people and there are workaway schemes all over the world uh, where you can volunteer so if you feel like you need to do something you, you need to yeah. do some labor of some description or help people there's lots and lots of opportunities but you're not you're not going to earn money from that no no but it, they often they will give you somewhere you can plug in and, and so you, again you're not paying campsite fees they feed you um, yeah and they often they yeah. feed you and the other big thing that a lot of people do is they work as campsite wardens and that's something we've talked about doing as well yeah. um, you can do that in the UK or you can do that in, in Europe um, that you know there are lots and lots of different ways of skinning the cat really I think we're done yeah as always if you've got any questions give us a shout we're always happy to sort of chat through um, yeah and uh Guys, until the next time, I'll just say very quickly, I do respond to, to comments, not always straight away. Uh, we're in the middle of a truck building, so it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a busy period for us. It is. Uh, but guys, thanks for all the support, and until the next time, bye, bye for now. Bye.